Well, thank you all for joining us uh, this morning or this evening or wherever you are uh, for a very special presentation here, uh, webinar uh, in memorial of the Titanic on this special day. We'll do a little uh, house cleaning uh, items here at the beginning. I'll introduce myself and our guests and then we'll get going. We've got some neat, exciting slides to go through and we'll get going. So we'll do some questions and answers at the end. So for one thing, if you have a question during the presentation, please hold on to it. At the end, we'll have some time for questions and answers, and um, I'll remind everyone as well then, but if you would address your question to one of us as the presenters, myself, Kyle, Rory, or Kathy, then we'll each uh, answer those best we can. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so if you need to leave early, not to worry, uh, we'll distribute the, um, the recording uh, on social media, um, as well as on the invitation list if you got it through email. So to get going, um, I'd like to welcome you all here. Um, my name is Kyle. I'm the expedition manager here at OceanGate. I'm joined here to my side by Stockton Rush, the CEO uh, of OceanGate, as well as Rory Golden and Kathy Lament, who you'll all meet here in just a few minutes. So to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about and introduce you to OceanGate, if you don't know us a, a little bit already. But OceanGate Expeditions here, um, a beautiful view there in the Bahamas where we were. Uh, for a few years testing. But headquartered here in Everett, Washington, though this photo you'll see isn't quite Everett, Washington, if you're familiar with the area or home to Boeing. Um, but we've been operating since 2009. Uh, Ocean Gate crew is focused on uh, accessing the deep ocean through innovation of the next generation of crewed submersibles and launch platforms. Um, sitting next to me here, our spearhead is Stockton Rush, the CEO. Um, he leads the way for us as we explore and innovate in the underwater world. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Kyle Bingham. I'm the expedition manager here at Ocean Gate Expeditions. Um, husband and father, I've got years of travel, 10 plus years in, in kind of the professional travel world. Uh, I do have a medical background too. I'm a remote EMT. I have credentials for offshore medical stuff, as well as my firefighter and a coffee lover, but overall uh, passionate for adventure. So we're getting primed here in just the next couple of months uh, to head to the Titanic. So beginning the summer in 2021, OceanGate Expeditions will begin a series of week-long missions to the wreck of the Titanic. Um, over the next few years, we'll continue to dive there and document the entirety of the wreck, uh, digitally document, and then every year after go back uh, to track and look at uh, how it changes over time uh, and how it's degrading. If you're not familiar with our submersibles, We'll be taking this one here, Titan, uh, to the Titanic this summer. Um, Titan, our, our, our submersible, ushers in a new era of ultra-exclusive deep-sea exploration. Um, and some unique pieces of the, of the submersible make it possible for more people to explore a little bit deeper. A great photo here of our uh, remote base we had uh, for a little over a year in the Bahamas as we tested uh, Titan in preparation for the Titanic. And a little bit unique platform we have uh, with the, the submersible and how we launch and recover the, the sub. You see the submersible there on the platform. And there's some of the crew that are getting in uh, from the dinghy. And the forward dome is open. And once we close that forward dome and prep everything, the whole platform heads underwater. From there, the sub detaches from the platform and heads off for its dive. Titan uh, is the only five-person deep diving submersible. It offers much more room and comfort and flexibility as uh, submersibles in the past or others that have explored the Titanic specifically. Uh, we have 4K external cameras, over 40,000 lumens of lighting, forward sonar, wireless controls, and yes, we actually have a toilet on board. There's enough room for five persons, so we have three mission specialists, um, a pilot and an expert or scientist that join each dive. There's more to see as well. Uh, Titan has the largest viewport of any deep diving submersible, a little over 20 inches. That compared to the mirror subs in the past that have explored the Titanic, a little less than eight inch viewports. Here's a great shot of one of our pilots, Kenny, looking forward through that forward viewport. Um, if you can see in his hand too, he has a, uh, a game console controller. Uh, we use a Logitech gaming controller actually to, to drive the submersible. So it's wireless, you can move about the cabin, uh, get to the forward dome, move back to the pilot seat um, or wherever you need to within the cabin and still have the, the pilot controls in your hand. 
The submersible also has integrations for its exterior cameras. Uh, we use these pads here. You can see a personal pad that Stockton is holding. And here's a little more detail. So we can view the exterior cameras. You can look at sonar and some other data uh, in real time. So if you're not looking for through that forward dome, you can still get a good perspective of what's going on around you. Here to highlight a popular question, the world's deepest loo. Um, this is really engineered as an observation seat uh, in the forward dome that can be shared with a couple of people to get a good look out that forward dome, but also in case of emergency, uh, can be used as a restroom with a privacy curtain, um, just in case. And these expeditions that we have planned for this summer and beyond are true scientific expeditions. Uh, we use the latest in sub-T technology um, to digitally survey and document the wreck, assess its condition, as I mentioned, and then watch that over time to see how things change. So once more, that is our, our scientific objective for, for this year and for beyond. Beginning June of this summer um, in St. John's, we'll be leaving and returning St. John's, Newfoundland. And that departure from St. John's and return in that local area, especially the target, the Titanic itself, is really why we're here today. And one of the things that we want to highlight, talk about, memorialize and celebrate. And we really want to talk about our expeditions and how we conduct them with the greatest respect for those that lost their lives in the tragic sinking of the Titanic, as well as those that celebrate those that survived and all those that have been touched by the Titanic and the Titanic story. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first guest. This is Kathy Lamette. Kathy is Ocean Gate's Titanic community liaison uh, she's a passionate to Titanic historian, um, and she helps to ensure our expeditions are performed with the utmost respect and reverence at the Titanic. So I'm going to hand things over to Kathy now, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the lives of the passengers and crews on the Titanic. So Kathy, go ahead. Um, yep. Thank you. Thank you to Ocean Gate for inviting me to participate in this live webinar as I am very honored to be here today to share a presentation on the passengers and crew of the Titanic on the anniversary of the sinking. Just to give you a little bit of background about me, I live in the Seattle area and I'm very proud of my son as he has just purchased his first home. I work as a travel agent for AAA and I thoroughly enjoy helping people plan trips to share experiences and make memories with their family and friends. 20 years ago, I watched a documentary on TV about Titanic and immediately I knew I learned, wanted to learn more about this subject. Little did I know the direction this newfound passion would take me. In addition to reading countless books on the subject, I joined the Titanic Historical Society and have traveled to Belfast, Southampton, Cherbourg, Cove, formerly Queenstown, Halifax, New York City, Washington, D.C., Denver, the Queen Mary, and have visited numerous Titanic artifact exhibits, including the Luxor in Las Vegas, where the big piece is on display. While traveling for Titanic events, this travel agent in me also visits other points of interest along the way, and I am very grateful for all of these experiences. I also belong to many other Titanic societies throughout the world and have attended conferences and conventions and learned so much about the ship, her passengers, and crew. It is very special to me when I visit a grave or a memorial for someone who was on the Titanic. I have also met many special people from throughout the world in person and on Facebook who share this common passion within the Titanic community. A few years ago, I decided to start a blog on Facebook and write a short biography daily to honor a passenger or crew member, and I call it Titanic Remembrance. Over 550 passengers and crew members have been honored to date. I am also currently writing a book about the passengers and crew of the Titanic. I'm also grateful for, that my son, family, friends, and coworkers are supportive of my Titanic passion, along with other interests that are very special to me. In 2018, I nearly fell over when I realized that Ocean Gate was located at Everett, the state of Washington, only an hour away from me. I immediately signed up on their mailing list, and in the summer of 2019, I went on a dive in the submersible Cyclops 1 in the waters around their headquarters. Diving in Cy Cyclops 1 to observe marine life in its natural habitat was a phenomenal experience. The highlight of the day was seeing a beautiful lion's mane jellyfish. It was fun to be given the controls for Cyclops 1 and drive the submersible, plus make the ascent topside. I felt safe with Ocean Gate and observed firsthand how well the team works together, and the entire day of being a mission specialist with Ocean Gate will always be etched in my memory. As if that were not enough, Ocean Gate made two Academy Award-winning videos of my dive. 
After my dive, I became a volunteer with Ocean Gate, and last year for the anniversary of the sinking, Ocean Gate asked me to write a tribute for the passengers and crew, which was made into a beautiful video. Currently, I am honored to serve Ocean Gate as the Titanic Community Liaison. Ocean Gate understands the essence of being respectful of the wreck site, and this is where 1,496 people lost their lives, and 712 survivors had their lives changed forever. Many families throughout the world were affected by this tragedy in 1912. The present day families of the Titanic passengers and crew love to tell the story of their relative and are very protective of that story. Ocean Gate is committed to being respectful to the memory of their loved one. And so for the 109th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, we remember the passengers and crew of the lost vessel. We will honor today 11 passenger and crew members as a representation of all the passengers and crew members of the Titanic. It is very fitting to begin this presentation by honoring the workers who built the Titanic. These workers got up early every day and worked long, hard hours to build this great ship. And one such man was Jack Gilpin. Jack was a carpenter who worked on building the Titanic. He was humble, hardworking, and would help anyone in need. His family currently has the tools he used in building this great ship. Next, we'd like to honor Leah and Frank Philly Axe, third class passengers. Sam on the left in the photo was living in Norfolk, Virginia, where Leah and baby Philly would join him from Poland. During the sinking, Leah used a human ladder to scale a wall and, hand ahead, and had to hand off baby Philly. During this process, the baby disappeared. Unbeknownst to Leah, while in a lifeboat, Thankfully, Philly was safe in another lifeboat. After three unimaginable days on the Carpathia, Leah heard Philly's cry and Philly reached out to his mommy. The Italian lady who was holding Philly claimed him as her own child. Captain Rostron called both women into his cabin and Leah correctly said Philly had a strawberry birthmark and that he was circumcised. Leah was so appreciative to Captain Rostron for reuniting her with her child that she and Sam named their daughter, Sarah Carpathia Axe. The nurses in the hospital though, they accidentally filled out the birth certificate as Sarah Titanic Axe. This family lived a happy life. Next, we have Robert Bateman, the Reverend Robert Bateman, second class. Reverend Bateman was originally from England. He and his family lived in Canada, Maryland, Florida, and Tennessee while he did his ministry work. He was also a stonemason. In 1912, the Reverend had traveled back to England to visit his family and then made arrangements to accompany his widowed sister-in-law, Ada Balls, back to the United States on the Titanic. In the early evening of the sinking, he held a prayer service in the second-class dining room for the passengers. During the sinking, he put Ada into a lifeboat, handed her his necktie, and reportedly his Bible and said, If I don't meet you again in this world, I will in the next. His body was recovered by the cable ship Mackey Bennett, and he was buried in Florida. Next, we have Dorothy Gibson, first class passenger. Dorothy was a singer, dancer, silent screen star, and a model with her image gracing magazine covers, postcards, and merchandise of the Edwardian era. She and her mother were vacationing in Europe when she was called back to the studio to begin work on a series of new films. Dorothy and her mother boarded Titanic in Cherbourg and survived the sinking in Lifeboat 7. Approximately one month after the sinking, Dorothy played herself in the movie Saved from the Titanic. Unfortunately, no copies of this movie are known to exist. Dorothy married twice with both of these marriages ending in divorce and separation. And by 1928, she and her mother settled in France. They became involved in fascist politics and intelligence work. During World War II, Dorothy switched her allegiance, was arrested by the Gestapo in Italy and was imprisoned in a concentration camp from which she escaped in 1944. And Dorothy died in France in 1946. And a special thank you to Randy Brian Bigham for sharing these beautiful photos of Dorothy with, from his collection with us. Major Archibald Butt, first class passenger. Archie was born into a middle class family in Augusta, Georgia. He began his career in journalism and while working in Washington, DC, he served as secretary to the American minister to Mexico. During the Spanish American war, Archie received a commission in the US volunteer service and served as captain in the Philippines. He retained his, his rank of captain when he was transferred into the regular army, and he served in Cuba before being transferred to Washington, D.C. Due to his stellar military career, Archie became the military aide to President Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft. 
In early 1912, Archie's health began to deteriorate, and he took a much-needed rest in Europe with his close friend, Francis Miller. The two men boarded Titanic for the return trip to the U.S. Archie was lost in the sinking, and Miller's body was recovered by the Mackay Bennett. And the photo on the right is in Arlington, Arlington Cemetery, um, and this is Archie's memorial there. Next, we have Edith Course Evans, first class passenger. Edith was a single lady from New York City when she boarded Titanic in Cherbourg after a trip to Europe. On the night of the sinking, Colonel Archibald Gracie led Edith and Carolyn Brown to the lifeboats. Carolyn was married and her husband and children were at home in Boston. At the boats, Edith said to Carolyn, you go first, you have children waiting at home. Edith faltered afterwards while attempting to enter the lifeboat and the boat left without her. Edith died in the sinking and her body is not known to have been recovered. The photo on the right is uh, from the church where Edith worshiped in New York City, Grace Church, that's her memorial. And then at the bottom is Carolyn Brown's uh, grave outside of Boston. Henry Morley and Kate Phillips, second class passengers. Henry was a senior partner of a confectioner shop in Worcester and 19 year old Kate worked in the shop. The two boarded Titanic in Southampton to begin a life together in Los Angeles. They were traveling under the name Marshall as Henry was leaving his wife and child behind. Henry had told his family and friends he was planning to rest and recuperate from an illness in California where the weather was better. Henry died in the sinking and Kate survived. Kate returned to her family in England and on January 11, 1913, she gave birth to a daughter whom she named Ellen. Kate claimed Henry was the father, although this could not be proven. In January of 2021, just this year, Kate's great-granddaughter announced that she and the grandson of Henry's younger brother had a DNA test done and that Henry was indeed Ellen's father. Evelyn Marston, stewardess. Evelyn was born in Australia, and when she was a young girl, she often visited a farm where she learned to row against the currents. After her nursing training, she worked in hospitals in Melbourne. In 1908, she set off for England, and she met her future husband, who was a doctor serving on the liner Macedonia. Evelyn began service on the Olympic and survived the collision with the HMS Hawk. Evelyn signed on to the Titanic in Southampton, in Southampton as a stewardess and a nurse to the first class passengers. During the sinking, Dr. Simpson brought Evelyn and Mary Sloan into his room and gave them each a shot of whiskey. Evelyn survived the sinking and in the aftermath, married Dr. William James later that year. The couple relocated to Australia and did not have any children. Evelyn visited the farm where she learned her boating skills and she thanked the family for teaching her how to row and handle a boat properly. Evelyn died in 1938 and her husband passed away a week later. They were buried in an unmarked grave and in 2000, a stone was placed for the couple. Margaret Brown, first class passenger. Margaret Brown was a woman way ahead of her time and that's actually an understatement. At the age of 19, she left her hometown of Hannibal, Missouri and settled in Leadville, Colorado where her sister lived. There she met and married James Joseph Brown and the couple had two children. James became one of the most successful mining men in the US. Throughout her life, Margaret was very involved in human rights and raising funds for charities. Eight years before women had the right to vote, Margaret was the first woman in the country to run for political office, the Senate. Margaret also studied the subjects of literature, language and drama at the Carnegie Institute in New York. In 1912, Margaret and her daughter were traveling in Europe and Egypt when Margaret's first grandchild became ill. Margaret boarded the Titanic in Cherbourg, France for the trip home. During the sinking, Margaret assisted other passengers into the boats and then she was forced into lifeboat six herself. Once aboard the rescue ship Carpathia, Margaret quickly established the survivors committee and raised $10,000 for the survivors in financial need. On May 29, 1912, Margaret presented Captain Rostron with a silver loving cup and a medal to each crew member of the Carpathia. In 1932, Margaret was awarded the French Legion of Honor for her work in helping organize the Alliance Francaise, her relief efforts in World War I, her work in raising money for the Titanic survivors, and her work on the juvenile court in Denver. Margaret also helped raise funds for the Titanic Memorial in Washington, D.C and she passed away at the Barbizon Hotel in New York City on October 26, 1932. The photo bottom left is Margaret in her dining room giving a dinner party. And then on the bottom in the center 
is Margaret when she was 27 years old in her first gown. And the photo on the bottom right is of Captain Rostron's great granddaughters, Margaret and Janet, and also Margaret Brown's great granddaughter, Helen Benziger, with the loving cup. Thank you, Helen Benziger, very much for the bottom row of photos. And the top row of photos are from when I visited the Margaret Museum, Margaret Brown Museum house in Denver. William Besant, fireman. William was born in 1871 in Hampshire, England, and in 1891 he married Emily Cole. From the 1911 census, William and Emily were living in Southampton with five of their children. William signed on to the Titanic on April 6, 1912 as a fireman. He was lost in the sinking and his body is not known to have been recovered. In the days following the Titanic disaster, Emily and the families of other Southampton crew members waited for news of their loved ones. Emily was now a widow with five children to care for. She did receive assistance from the Titanic Relief Fund, but she had a very difficult time and the family lived in poverty. Emily continued to live in the same house she shared with her husband and she never remarried. This story represents how difficult it was for the hundreds of families in Southampton who lost a family member when the Titanic sank. Milvina Dean, third class passenger. Milvina D Dean had the distinction of being the youngest nine weeks old and the last living survivor of the Titanic. She embarked on the Titanic in the arms of her mother, Eddie, her father, Bertram, and her two-year-old brother, Bertie, in Southampton. The family were immigrating to Wichita, Kansas, where her father hoped to open a tobacconist shop. Bertram was lost in the sinking and his body is not known to have been recovered. Eddie, Bertie, and Milvina all survived the disaster and they returned to England on the Adriatic. Back in Southampton, the family was assisted by various Titanic survivor funds. Milvina did not know she was on the Titanic until her mother told her when she was eight years old. Milvina worked for the government drawing maps during World War II and later she worked for a purchasing department in an engineering firm. Milvina did not marry. In her 70s, Milvina became a Titanic celebrity appearing in documentaries, TV, radio shows, and conventions. Milvina attended the Titanic Historical Society convention in 1996 in Belfast, and she was, where she was a guest of honor. She also traveled aboard the Queen Mary II in 1997 to the US and finished the trip her parents began when she visited the house in Wichita that her parents had planned to live in. During her retirement in Southampton, Milvina was busy with her Titanic events, sharing her story with school children and signing autographs. Her close friend, Bruno Nordmanis, accompanied her to many events and traveled with her. Milvina passed away in Southampton on May 31st, 2009. Milvina was an example of living her life with kindness and a sense of humor, and that was her motto. And here is Milvina's memorial in Southampton. The International Ice Patrol was formed in 1914 as a response to the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Since their beginning, there have not been any iceberg incidents on their watch. Each year on the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic, the International Ice Patrol drops a wreath over the site in the North Atlantic where the tragedy occurred. And actually this ceremony is taking place today, April 14, 2021. There were 2,208 passengers and crew aboard the Titanic, 1,496 perished and 712 survived. Each passenger or crew member had his or her own story. For the victims, their stories would tragically end the night of the sinking. And for the survivors, their lives would go on as best they could. The Ocean Gate mission specialists and the Ocean Gate team will play an important role to ensure that the Titanic and her passengers and crew will be remembered into the future through the data, photos, and video collected on the Titanic survey expeditions beginning in 2021. Thank you all for your time in honoring the passengers and crew. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to the following family members and, histor and historians for sharing photos and family history with us. Maureen McKinney, Shelley Binder, Randy Bryan Bigham, George Behe, Beverly Lynn Roberts, Heather Alderson, Helen Benziger, and Julie Cook. Thank you all. May they all rest in peace. With that, I want to introduce our next guest speaker, Rory Golden. Rory is uh, our Titanic Expedition Technical Advisor for uh, this year's expedition. He's a Titanic dive veteran, a historian, advisor, and with that, I'll hand it off to you, Rory. Um, go ahead and take it away. 
Hi there. Good evening, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. And thank you, uh, Kyle and Stockton, for inviting me here. And um, I was asked to give um, a quick gallop about my background and where I came from and how this path took me to the Titanic eventually. <clears throat> the Irish connection is, ob is obvious with the Titanic. How did I get on this way? Well, I was actually born in Canada in my early days and uh, came to Ireland as a youngster. But back then, I had a, I had a great yearning to, to travel, obviously, then, because my parents discovered that I had this wandering ability, and they rigged me up with my own lifeline and a safety harness, which came very useful very many years later, climbing up the mountains in France. I grew up in an era of underwater exploration in the times of Jacques Cousteau, the man who uh, co-invented the underwater breathing apparatus, the scuba regulator. And I was fascinated by that underwater world and got fascinated with the world of shipwrecks, such as the Andrea Doria, the Lusitania, the Empress of Britain, and of course, the Titanic. In 1976, there was great excitement in Ireland because a lot of Sp Spanish Armada wrecks from 1588 had been discovered. And that's what got me decided then to take the plunge literally. And I took up scuba diving as a hobby and activity. Back then we had these very thick wetsuits, very thick life jackets <clears throat> and very thick hair. Long, long gone since then. <clears throat> also in 1976, by sheer coincidence in Loch Ness, there was a National Geographic team comprising of a man called Ralph White, Emery Christoph, David Dubelet, and an upcoming young geologist called Robert Ballard. And they were looking for the Loch Ness Monster and lamenting the fact that there was a great lack of underwater technology and camera systems. And they came up with the idea that how could they get something to bring people's interest to develop deep water imaging systems. And so they said, well, let's go come up with the idea to look for the Titanic, the world's most famous shipwreck. The shipwreck that happened as on the anniversary tomorrow that took so many people from my country, from Ireland, boarding in Queenstown and Cove and Cork, sailing across the sea, carrying people who were looking for new hopes and dreams, including people from a little village in the west of Ireland called Lahardan. 14 of them left and 30, <coughs> 11 of them didn't make it across. Other people as well from around the country, both in Belfast, some of the crew members, the people who built the ship, people from all over the countryside. And they're the people we also remember today. This is one of the last photographs taken by the famous Father Brown who disembarked at Cove after the people who boarded 123 of them took flight to sail across the Atlantic. So at this stage, I was in the music industry. I had a great taste in um, hair and flares, as you can see. Uh, it was a great time of my life, great fun. Uh, but in the 1979, the 1980s, the, uh, the industry collapsed, and I turned my hobby of diving, went away to Fort Bobbison in England, where I spent the next three months becoming a commercial diver. And uh, some of my friends got this card made up for me and prophetically had written on a golden explorer. So I spent the next three months there in wonderful conditions, as you can see, learning how to become a commercial diver. And after three months graduated, learning how to use not just one, but two hammers underwater. Fate intervened, though, and prevented me from going off to the work in the oil rigs in the North Sea because I was offered the opportunity to take over the running of the Virgin Record Company in Ireland. It wasn't a hard choice to make. I spent the next 15 years hanging out with some great people, including people like this guy here, Meatloaf, with his Bat Out of Hell 2 album. But again, 1999, the record industry imploded, and I had to um, take another career move. But that was in 1985 when I started. And by, again, coincidence, that same year, people decided that they would go find the Titanic. Ralph White and Emery, Robert Ballard, finally got the expedition together, and they decided to go off with a joint venture with Woods Hole and Ifremere from France. The co-expedition leaders, Robert Ballard and Jean-Louis Michel from Ifremere. And on that fateful day in the 1st of September 1985, after many, many weeks of searching, the Titanic was finally found. And on board that expedition, Ralph White brought 
an Explorers Club flag with him. This image here is one of the very first images taken by Woods Hole as Titanic was discovered. And here is Ralph with Bob Ballard with the Explorers Club flag from that trip. And so three years later, we brought Ralph White to Ireland. He had been on the second expedition in 1987 with the French, where they recovered many artifacts. And so many people turned up for that talk that he had to do two talks back to back. Meanwhile, I was getting out my recreational diving activities uh, at home in Ireland. I had discovered lots of wrecks around Dublin Bay and had taken up technical diving. This was a training dive in a big quarry in Wales called Dorothea in preparation for a Lusitania dive that actually never happened. That's another story. But as I said, in 1999, uh, the record industry imploded. And once again, I was looking for a career change. I started my own diving company and dive school called Flagship. We just finished 20 years a few years ago. And we spent 15 years on this old ship, ironically, an old ferry that used to bring people out to the Aran Islands in the west of Ireland. So the following year, I got a, a phone call from Ralph White saying they were going back to Titanic and he was put my name forward to go on that expedition. And so I went to Canada, joined the Russian ship, the Keldish, home of the two mere submersibles. And I had no guarantees of a dive, but I had brought a memorial plaque from Cove, Queenstown, to commemorate all those who had lost their lives on Titanic. And this would be the first time that anything from Ireland had actually been left on the wreck. And so I made my dive and we recovered many, many items over the course of that period of time, including these most amazing finds some of you I'm sure have heard of. These were samples of perfume that have survived the incredible crushing pressure. And then when they came back to the surface, we took out the stoppers and unbelievably, the perfume was still intact and all around the laboratory that evening, wonderful smells of flowers, lavender, roses, lemons, limes, were just whispering around the laboratory. And it was a moment that to us, it was as if the ship had come back to life. And then a few years later, in 2005, I had the chance to go back where I joined Mike McKim from BBC Northern Ireland, and we made a documentary. And that documentary was about bringing two memorial plaques from Belfast. One from Harland and Wolf, the company that made the ship, and one from Belfast City Hall, uh, a small version of the memorial that's outside Belfast City Hall. This is the inside of the sub, of the, one of the mirrors, and you can see how cramped you are. You can see over in the far corner, uh, Ralph White's knees and my knees on the left-hand side, and that's uh, Anatoly Sagalovich, the designer and chief scientist of the Russian Academy of Sciences who co-designed the subs. So this was the state-of-the-art technology back then, and now we have the new generation of subs that OceanGate have developed with a radical new design that can take far more people in comfort. Uh, going down to the sea, you have no sensation of falling. This is an image of the digital depth gauge. Unlike an airplane, there's no change in pressure inside, but the pressure outside is increasing substantially until it's 6,000 pounds a square inch on the bottom of the ocean. After two and a half hours of slowly falling to the bottom, the end comes in sight. The lights come on. We look out through the small portals and you can see the bottom of the Atlantic right in front of you. And it's just a, a plain looking muddy area. There's nothing really to see that looks dead and lifeless. And yet, as we move off, we start to see lights flickering, little plants growing. And then a starfish came into view. Rat-tailed fish swim past the windows. And the sonar, this is actually a photograph of the sonar of the bow of the Titanic in front of us. You can see the date on the bottom, 5th of August, 2005. That's a photograph I took inside that sub on that day. And as we head off into the dark, slowly making our way across the bottom, the sonar starts to pick up more and more. And as we're looking through the dark, the sub lifts it up. And there you are in front of you, a sight that very few people have had the privilege of seeing in person. A sight that I will never forget. And every time I see these images, I'm, I'm back in that sub, I'm back looking here at the hopes and dreams of people 
who were sailing across the Atlantic trying to start a new life, the very rich who were on a cruise, the very poor who just barely afforded the, the, the fare across, a ship that was a time capsule, brand new, a time capsule of events, a time capsule of fate and death. And you can see the decay of the ship, the rusticles that are eating away at the, the steel around the ship. It's an incredibly exciting moment and it's also an incredibly sad moment. Here you can see this arrow showing you the seabed. And this indicates to you where the actual bow is embedded in the mud. That's that level of mud and that's the below section of where the, the ship is buried. We make our lay along then looking up over the bow and where the fallen mast is. And in the five years time difference that I had made, that mast had actually collapsed. This is the second image that I took in 2005 compared to the first one in 2000. And you can see where the maps, the mast had collapsed. And this remember is 16 years ago. So it's going to be amazing to see the difference how much more the wreck has deteriorated between then and now. Our tour then takes us up along over the top. This is a very famous area. Looking down here, we are looking into the Marconi radio room, the room where Harold Bride and Jack Phillips sent out those SMS messages looking for help to other ships in the area. And remember, these two men were heroes. These were the two men that repaired the radio that had broken a few days beforehand in breach of company rules. Had they not done this, the ship may not have been able to send out messages that would have reached the likes of the Carpathia that came to their rescue. And again, to give you a sense of scale and perspective, dropping along the, the port side of the ship, we drop along down off the boat deck and the promenade deck, looking here. Along the side, again, you can see the rusticles, the decay that's taking place of the ship because of these tiny microorganisms. And to put it in, again, perspective where we are on the ship, this image will show you where I am at the sub at that point. Again, a sense of scale. These are some of the staterooms dropping down the side of, of the ship. Rectangular port hole windows and semicircular ones as well like that. And again, to put it in perspective, this is where we are dropping down the side looking at these areas. As we know, the ship split into two, and it was like an egg cracking open, and all the contents spilled out, including lumps of coal and all the other fittings and everything around the whole massive area of debris. And we make our way across, we come across all these areas. And the stern section is a very dangerous area of the wreck site. The bow is the classic image of a ship, but the stern area is a massive jumbled and steel entanglements. And in fact, on, on the first dive I was on, we actually got caught a little bit in this wreckage, one of the skids of the sub, which was a scary moment, but the, uh, the pilot got, got his way out of it. Here's, a, here's an image that I love seeing. This is one of Titanic's massive engines. Remember, she had the biggest uh, steam engines in the world of her time, and they were huge. They were about 10 meters, nearly 30, 40 feet tall. To, to give it a sense of perspective, here is an image of one of those engines in the workshop in Harlan and Wolf. What's unusual about this particular image, and if you look down the right-hand corner, you can see a man standing there to give you a sense of scale. But most photographs that people think of Titanic are actually of Olympic. But this is actually one of Titanic's own engines because in the bottom left-hand corner of the base of that engine is the number 401, which was Titanic's yard number. So I have now spent both uh, a total of about 20 hours on the Titanic. The first dive, we spent 12 hours, and the second dive, we spent a little over eight or nine. And all down there, you think there's an area of decay and death. And yet, the Titanic now is a, is a microorganism of, of life, life in the form of, of creatures like this, like this little prawn that zoomed past our window as we started to make our ascent back to the surface. The rat tail fish that are down there, the, the anemones, all the other 
plants that are down there that I know the scientists who are coming on the mission with Ocean Gate are going to have a, a fantastic time analyzing. I'm not a scientist, I'm not a qualified archaeologist, but I'm a passionate uh, person who understands and wants to learn more about these things, as I hope everybody else will from these expeditions over the next few years. And as you pull away, you don't want to leave because you've had such an amazing experience being down there. It took us uh, three hours to get back on the first time, but the two hours the second time, and you've now spent all that time. And people ask me what it's like when you get out of the sub, when you meet all your friends and shake hands with them. But the reality is, having been in a very cramped situation, in the cold, starving, having not eaten properly for the day before, you end up really feeling and looking a bit like this. And just to wrap up, a few more things to tell you about. On my first dive in 2000, in the last 50 minutes of that dive, we made one last sweep along the officer's deck. And in a corner, tucked away near the expansion joint, I saw a semicircular shape sticking out of the mud and the debris. And I got very excited because I saw behind that an A-frame. And I looked at Ralph and I said, do you see what I see? And he was looking on the cameras and he said, I think we've just redeemed ourselves, Rory. Because a robotic arm went in and pulled out this. And this is the remains of the main ship wheel. The wheel that was in the wheelhouse of Titanic. The wheel that... Robert Hitchens was standing at as he was given the, the order to hard a starboard away from the iceberg. And incredibly, that this wheel was still there, hadn't been destroyed or lost, and we recovered it. And when we brought it back to the surface, despite being underwater for all that length of time, it was so well greased, it still turned in its bearings, a tribute to the workmanship of Harland and Wolf. And you can see the three stumps of the spokes that held that wheel together. That was quite an incredible find. And I have never met, but we have communicated many times, Simon Medhurst, who was actually the great grandson of Robert Hitchens. And one day I hope to meet that man, as indeed I hope to meet other people who are related to the Titanic. And I have met relatives and descendants, people like Susie Miller, the, the current chair and president of the uh, Titanic Belfast Society. The Adagul 14, I've met some of their relatives. Um, it gives you a direct connection with these people. You're not talking about strangers that you don't know. You have this connection and you make these connections. And another strange coincidence in my life. In 1980, my very first wreck dive was on a ship off the, west, off the east coast of Ireland on Lamb Bay Island. A ship that sailed from Liverpool on its maiden voyage one of the biggest ships of its day, state-of-the-art, an ironclad clipper sailing ship. The compasses didn't work properly, and the ship ran aground on Lambay Island two days out from Liverpool. 350 people lost their lives, and most of those were women and children. Sounds familiar. Well, that ship was the White Star Line, and it went bankrupt in 1868. And Thomas Ismay bought the rights to the name and the name of the company. A strange quirk of fate. And on that very first dive, sticking out of the sand near the wrecks, which was only in 18 meters of water, I saw a semicircular shape. And when I scraped away all the sand, out came this um, block, this wooden block pulley, which I still have to this day. And finally, we talked about people who were connected with the ship. And Kathy mentioned Melvina earlier on. And I met Melvina a few times, and she did have a great sense of humor. And my little story to finish up about Melvina is that she was in Cove one year for a Titanic event. She, I met her in the lobby of the hotel one morning. The rest of the gang had gone off on a bus tour. I asked her why hasn't she gone with them. She said, oh, I want to go to Photo Island to see the Arboretum, Arboretum? the flowers. I said, well, I'll give you a lift. She got into my car with her great buddy Bruno and it was a warm day I had the air conditioning on and she looked at me and she said Rory it's a bit chilly in here and I said well very sorry I'll turn off the air conditioning Melvina and she said oh thank you Rory I do feel the cold you know ever since that iceberg that's the sort of woman Melvina was thank you very much everybody and uh, those of you who are going on the expedition 
look forward to seeing you on board. And those of you who are watching, thank you all for taking the time and listening to my little story of how I got to um, Belfast, Titanic, Cove. But I didn't do it on my own. Lots of people helped me on the way. So we've got a few minutes left here. We'll wrap up here in just short of 10 minutes. But if you have a question for myself, for Kathy or Rory, please feel free uh, to type it in the, the chat box here in the presentation. If you wouldn't mind, uh, address your question as you type it to Rory, uh, to Kathy, or to myself. And we'll do the best we can to each uh, answer your question individually. If you have questions or we're not able to get to yours in time, um, not to worry. You can always reach out to us uh, at OceanGateExpeditions.com. Uh, we have a contact form, and I'll be sure and forward any questions to any of the presenters, um, and they can respond to you in time. So, Rory and Kathy, if you're able to see the uh, the chat box there in your view, yep, you yep. You see, if you get a question that's directed to you, you can uh, if you see one that has your name on, you can check the green check box and um, and answer if you'd like. Sure. Uh, here's one for Kathy. Kathy, we have a question here. I don't know if you saw if you have any more dives planned. Well, we'll see what the future brings. I absolutely love diving with Ocean Gate. The, the dive that I had outside of this uh, Seattle area was just, like I said before, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, the whole, I'd never obviously been in a submersible before. So the experience of going in the submersible to see all the safety precautions that are taken before, during, and after, um, and learn about Ocean Gate, um, there's it was just a tremendous experience. Um, so yeah, it was fantastic. All right, question here from Jaden to Rory: um, What changes uh, to the ship are you interested in exploring in the 15 years since you were last there? That's uh, that is the uh, the one hundred thousand dollar question, isn't it? Um, the rates of decay have been discussed over so many years. People thought the wreck would disappear after, you know, only twenty or thirty years. Then they said fifty years, and they said a hundred years. I think the only conclusive way of finding this out is by continuous trips over a period of time. There are yard marks um, that people have have used in the past. I mean, the very first thing we have is that we know how old the ship was when it sank. It was brand new. So that in itself is a starting point. And because the deep oceans are something that we still know very little about, these type of, of scientific expeditions are going to give us more and more information. The fact that we have literally a, a reef, because that's what, the, that's what the Titanic is now down there. It's a reef full of marine life. And where death and decay is, new life is also growing. And all these microbiology uh, scientists who are going to be down there investigating this stuff, they are going to find amazing discoveries, I believe. And I also think that we're going to see more and more areas of decay, particularly in the lighter areas of the ship where the seal isn't as strong as the hull. I mean, the hull will be the last thing to go over time. Um, it's going to be an eye-opener. I mean, there was a very brief trip two years ago. Um, but this is going to be a very, very long mission and expedition. And I think there's going to be some amazing discoveries and some new things to be uh, learned about the wreck down there. Chelsea asked, uh, yeah, I'm, that's, I'm booked. I'm booked for all the missions, Chelsea. You're going to have to put up with my very bad warp sense of humor for all that time. We had a, uh, there was a question about what we're going to do with the digital images. Uh, the plan is to make those available to individuals and researchers for non-commercial use. Uh, there may be some uh, that, that our media partners need, but um, you know we are going to uh, get that and the data out uh, as quickly as possible. So um, it should be uh, should help uh, spur interest and in, in research into the wreck. Going from Heather, Virginia Beach, um, Asking how long the project is, uh, looks like you joined a little bit late for the, the expedition. But yeah, well, the expedition begins this summer. Uh, the 27th of June is the, the beginning of this year's expedition, which will conclude uh, on the second week of August. And we plan on doing these expeditions every summer uh, here on out. A uh, question about the water temperature. Of course, Rory's been down there. It's, it's pretty close to freezing. So typically one to two degrees centigrade. And it'll be uh, the 
uh, Titan submersible being carbon fiber and titanium uh, is significantly warmer inside than just a titanium sphere, particularly if you have five individuals who are very excited to see the wreck. They generate a lot of body heat. So inside, we typically run about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, higher than the ambient water temperature, um, and uh, maybe slightly higher uh, in, uh, in this case. Yeah, a couple questions about artifact uh, recovery for uh, the expedition. Uh, we will not be recovering any artifacts, um, not bringing anything up. Um, this expedition is to document the current state of the wreck uh, in a digital sense. So we'll be using a laser scanner as well as high definition cameras uh, to capture the wreck in its current state digitally. So no, no artifact recovery. We've got just a moment here. If there's any last minute questions, go ahead and type them in. If not, uh, if you think of questions later, again, feel free to reach out to us at OceanGateExpeditions.com. If there's a question for Rory or Kathy specifically, you can send it to us in the contact form there and make sure it gets to them. Otherwise, I want to thank uh, Rory and Kathy both for their time and their presentation today. Um, I want to thank Stockton for his time as well. He joined me from the Ocean Gate team and all those that joined us today uh, to remember the Titanic. Just want to thank you for joining and we hope you have a great and wonderful rest of your day today and give the Titanic a little bit of thought uh, today and tomorrow. Thank you guys. <laughs>